Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Going Deeper this evening. Are you glad you're here? Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad you're here, but, you know, I'm, uh, yeah, I know some people think that this is just religious talk. More, more than the fact that I'm glad you're here and I'm here, I'm glad the Holy Ghost is here. Amen. And, uh, yes, sir. In fact, he, he's already put some things in motion tonight. <laughs> I like to... Uh, you, you ever heard the old expression... Do something at the drop of a hat. Mm -hmm. You know, fight at the drop of a hat, you know, whatever. Well, I, I, I like to be ready to preach at the drop of a hat. In fact, I'll throw one down to get to preach. But just <laughs> as long as the hat hits the ground, <laughs> we'll be all right. But uh, God, when you've been in ministry, and I'm not trying to pontificate about age or anything, but when you've been in the ministry as many years as I have, if you've been faithful to it, uh, you stay studied up. It's not like you have to sit down and develop an outline every time you get ready to walk into the pulpit. You've got, you're, you're, by this time in my life, I'm built with outlines. <laughs> anyway, I go, I'm looking, I'm looking at something, something's ready to come out. So again, no, no, no arrogance in that. It's just experience. It's experience. Think back to professional baseball. Uh, in the day when players played, uh, and they weren't superstars after one season of batting 340. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to have eight or nine seasons of batting 300 plus to be considered a superstar. I remember one of my favorite players, a guy named Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. Well, w Willie Mays had, had an incredible eye for a pitch. Uh, he, he was a power hitter. He could, he could swing for the fence. He, he could also play the position of the ball. He could punch him into either, any field. Uh, he could bunt and run. He could steal bases. Great fielder, great glove, just and played hurt. I, I saw his hands one time in a close-up shot holding the bat, and his fingers had been hit in his hand so many times by pitch balls. I don't know how the man closed his hand to hold a fart. But you didn't want to get one in the strike zone around William Hayes. In fact, you didn't even want one close to it because he, he'd tag you for it. But the point is, he didn't start that way. He got that way, and through dedication and commitment to the game, he became that player that in his day was the player on the field. Offense, defense, it didn't make any difference. He could run, he could steal, he could field, he could throw. I've seen him make throws from a center field fence in San Francisco that just absolutely amaze you. One hoppers to the catcher. What an arm. Look like a cannon. But again, he didn't get that way overnight. And when you see people who come onto the scene and they've got a great season and suddenly they're superstars, no, we're not superstars. They just, they just happen to get in a groove and stay in it for a time. The kingdom of God is the same way. Sadly, most churches that select their pastors some churches don't select them. The, the guys in the top office, wherever the top, they send them in. But some churches select their pastors. And do you know who gets selected to be the pastor in most churches like that? The guy with the latest hot sermon. I'm, not, I'm just going to be honest with you. That's why when, you, when, when a church loses a pastor, and I've seen this in multiple denominations, I've seen it happen more times than many more times than just once. They lose a pastor and they start bringing guys in. They're candidating for the pastoral office. And they come in and and the first two or three that come in, guess what sermon they're bringing? The best. Their best they've got. The best they've got. That's 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 all they've got. They've got that one hot, great sermon and they're going to bring that one and, that, and they preach that one time and get voted on. And guess what ends up pastoring the church? A one-hit wonder. And so sometimes it's sometimes it's a in fact. I, I was in a church once, and the guy the, the guy never got. He, in fact, he didn't when he came. He didn't even have a trailer to bring his goods in. He brought them in cardboard boxes. He never got the boxes out. Of the he was a one-hit wonder. He got voted on. That was it. 
Um, forgive me for being blunt, folks. Folks on YouTube, and Facebook, too. <laughs> no, don't forgive me for being blunt. You need to hear some truth. If pastors are chosen by <coughs> prayerful selection, you're probably not going to get a preaching machine. But I'll tell you what you will get. You get somebody who's knowledgeable of the Word of God and who can teach you all day long. Because that's what the body needs. Um, Jesus said this. He said, the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of life. Let, let's, let's go back a, a little bit. And, come, and this is going to lead right into what we're going to be doing here tonight. Satan is already defeated. It's been shown again and again that he cannot win. Okay? He, he may seem to be victorious in some skirmishes, but in the major battles, he always loses. He, he thought he won with Adam and the woman in the garden. But God had a plan. He, you know, the plan happened to be Noah, grandson of Methuselah. He thought that he had it when he got Israel captured in Egypt. But God had a plan. See, it may take some time to get that plan in position because major battles are not fought up overnight. It takes time. And then he thought uh, that he had them when Moses couldn't go into the promised land, but God had a Joshua. He thought, the devil thought he had Israel when Joshua was gone and there were no more great leaders, but God had a Gideon, a Samson, a Barak, a Deborah, and a Hood. God had a bunch of little guys in there that weren't well known, but by, they came out of that thing by me. That you talking about killing giants and whooping everything in sight. He thought when he ended the judges that if he could stop the judges, he could stop. But God had a plan. He had one more judge up his sleeve named Samuel, and Samuel comes along, and the Bible says that none of his words fell to the ground because God upheld everything he said. Wow! Talk about the operation of the gift of faith. The gift of faith, one of the nine gifts of the Spirit, is manifested when you say something and God acts on your words as though he said it. One of the most beautiful examples we see of that is Abraham taking Isaac up on the mountain to sacrifice him. Abraham had received in a dream, in a vision, if you will, in a form, Isaac being raised from the dead out of the ashes. He, he knew in his spirit, he, he understood what God was going to do, so he didn't have any reservation about that. But when they got to Moriah, which was later called Calvary, he took the wood off the donkey and loaded it on Isaac. That was a type of Jesus carrying his cross. Mm -hmm. With me? Yeah. And Abraham was a type of God sending his son to the cross on Calvary. It's a beautiful type and image, a picture of what was going on. Type and shadow is the term that's used. But when all the way up there, if you remember, Jesus had a question for the Father in the garden, didn't he? Father, if it's possible. possible. <laughs> See, he he knew what was going to happen, but he also knew the agony he was about. He didn't want to go through that. But it was Father's will for him to go ahead and go through with it. But on the way up with Abraham and Isaac, Isaac had a question. He had a little problem come up in his mind. What a sacrifice. <laughs> and Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. Now please, from this day forward, don't ever, don't ever say that God said or that Abraham said God will provide. That's not what Abraham said. 
Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. When they get up on that mountain, build the altar, they array the wood, Isaac he doesn't report this, but I mean, it's got to be going on. Isaac's a young man, probably 18, 20 years of age. Abraham's an old man. Let me ask you something. If push came to shove, who do you think would win the pushing match? <laughs> that 20 year old young buck or that 160 year old daddy? Or what about the 120 year old daddy? I think that young 20 year old man probably pushed him around pretty good. I mean, he's the one who carried the wood up there. Abraham didn't. Where's the sacrifice, Dad? What do you think Abraham's response was at that point in time? You it, son. <laughs> now, we don't have time to get into all this tonight, but maybe sometime we'll, we'll talk about this, talking about being obedient to, to the anointing that's in you. Isaac did not fight against him. Abraham did not have to wrestle him down and tie him and hoist him up on Isaac crawled up on that altar and laid down, baring his throat to his father's blade. Mm -hmm. Jesus. See, that's why God chose Abraham. Did you know that? You know what the Bible tells us why God chose Abraham? To make us through teachers. Because he would Jesus. train his children. And Abraham had taught his boy to be obedient to his daddy. And he said to Isaac, you're it, boy. And Isaac just climbed up on him. I'm, I'm serious. I've seen this in my spirit, man. Isaac just climbed right up on that top of that stack of wood and laid down. He wasn't concerned about being comfortable. He wasn't going to be alive that long. Mm -hmm. Laid down on that wood and let his head hang off the end of it, bearing the whole of the neck. And that blade that Abraham would have used didn't have to be sharp or with a point. It wasn't a stabbing blade. It was a slicing blade. Mm -hmm. And Abraham walks up to that altar and, and, and reaches up and takes hold of that boy's head because the body will do involuntary things. He takes hold of that boy's head and holds it in place and takes that knife that you can shave with mm -hmm. and laid it on the jugular and is getting ready to draw it across the throat. All, both jugglers, both karate's. The boy had been dead in about four seconds. He puts that blade up there. There's a voice. Stay your head. And he stops and turns around. And there's a ram. In the sea. Supernaturally created ram. God didn't steal one from somebody. God didn't go out and find one in the wild and hurry it in there. That was a supernaturally created ram in those bushes. Because Abraham had said. God will provide himself a sacrifice. Now, there's two things that were meant there. God provided the ram himself. No outside source brought that. That was God that did that. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, but catch this. Thousands, couple, oh, 2,500, 3,000 years later, there's a guy named Jesus who didn't want to go up there. But it was God's will, so he took the cross. He carried the cross and he fell. They got him up there and they crucified him. Who did they crucify? Let me ask you, back up. Who was Abraham about to slay? His only son. Took by Sarah at that point in time. The firstborn son through Sarah to Abraham, his firstborn, his only begotten. Look, Jesus up on the cross, up on the top of Golgotha, and they're getting ready to drive. Who, who are they about to crucify? The only begotten son. Why was Isaac up on that pile of wood? Because daddy told him to get up there. Isaac trusted what his father said, no matter what the circumstances looked like. If God had gone through with it the way he, the way Abraham had perceived it in his own heart and faith, he would have burned that boy to a cinder and God would have raised him from the dead out of the ashes. Mm -hmm. But Abraham said, God will provide himself a sacrifice. 
And so on the way up to Moriah with Abraham and Isaac, when they got up there and they're getting ready to, at the last moment, there is a ram. God provided himself a sacrifice. But then on Golgotha, when Jesus walked up there and they laid him on that cross and they nailed him to it. They didn't have to nail him to it. That was just part of the protocol for them. Jesus stretched out his arms. They didn't have to hold him down, tie him down. He was willing. He said, I lay my life down. No man takes it from me. Wow, what a, what, what, a, what a picture. And Abraham, oh, our Jesus, stretched out there, ready to be sacrificed. They're about to sacrifice the first begotten son. But let's, let's only begotten son of God, but let, let's think about just for just a moment. Who was Jesus in the beginning? The Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with, with God. God, and the Word was God. So who was Jesus in the beginning? God. He was God. So who was being sacrificed on the right? God. God was. He provided himself the sacrifice. See, we don't see, we don't, when we read that, we don't understand that there were four people involved in that covenant that day. God and Jesus. Abraham and Isaac. Because Abraham was willing to obey God. God is now in a position where he can sacrifice his own son. Because Isaac was obedient and willing to go through with it with his father. Jesus was willing to go through with it for his father and for you and me. Oh, wow. Wow. Who, who built the altar on Moriah? Abraham did. Abraham and Isaac. Who brought the wood up on Moriah? Isaac. Isaac. Who built the altar called Golgotha? God did when he created the earth. Who carried the wood? Jesus. What a picture. What a picture. You see, what Abraham saw in Isaac being raised from the dead out of the ashes, from the fire, what Abraham saw was a true prophetic view of Jesus after being crucified, going to hell and suffering the torments of hell and then God raising him up out of the fire, out of the ashes and restoring him fully. Oh, Lord. <sighs> Forgive me. For, for making the statement, but my brothers and sisters, this is the this, this this is what needs to be taught in the church today, so people will understand what has been bought for them. When you don't understand what Jesus did for us, you, you don't understand what. They, they, there's no wonder Christians get saved and find it so easy to go back and do. Oh, I, I, but Brother Morfield, haven't you ever sinned? Yeah, but it's none of your business unless you've got holes in your hands and feet. Amen. You got holes in your hands and your feet? We'll talk about it. Amen. But if I sin, I confess my sin to the Lord Jesus Christ that he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And when he forgives me, it's forgotten. He'll never bring it up again. Father won't remind me of it. He'll never remember it again. Holy Ghost won't remind me of it. He'll never give, bring it up again. And if you try to bring it up, I'm going to say, shame on you, you ugly thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let that kind of corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Yes. I know we're taught all of our lives. Well, you know, uh, you, you you know you can't trust everybody, Brother Morfield. I don't, but I trust God, and I can. I trust Him completely, so that oftentimes what looks like me trusting a man is me literally trusting God. Yeah. Because I'm not His judge. I'm not the record keeper. Yeah, but you know what that guy did five years ago? It doesn't make any difference what he did five years ago. If the blood of Jesus has been applied, that man is clean before Almighty God. And if I butt in on that deal and mess with it, I've got to answer to Jehovah. I don't want to answer to Jehovah. I'd rather, 
I'd rather get in the ring with Mike Tyson at the yeah. height of this gay game than to, than to think about standing before God and having to judge somebody the wrong way. Amen. Anyway. I'm talking about guarding the anointing. That, that whole scenario was about Abraham following the leading, the guiding of the anointing that was on the inside of him, preparing him all those years from the day he was 75 in Ur of the Chaldees to, till the day uh, 45 years later when he sac took his son to sacrifice him. It took the anointing 45 years to prepare him for that. We don't, we, we don't, we might. But sadly, the body of Christ doesn't understand that. They want to get saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, and bless God, right now I want it. I wanted a while ago. I don't know. Me, I'm not going to wait for it. Bless God, I'm going to have it yesterday. Right. Well, hang on, Jack. you got a long way coming. You do not become excellent at anything in this natural world overnight. It takes time. I don't care how much, quote, natural talent you have. I don't care how much... I don't care how ambidextrous you might be. You might be able to write your name with both hands at the same time in different directions. I don't care what you can do. That natural talent don't mean wit to anybody unless you can use it to save a life. Now you can be having something going. Well, aren't you amazed at people that can walk a high wire across Niagara Falls? No. No. Now, if I was hung out there and somebody needed to get me off, I might be impressed with it. <laughs> there was a great high wire walker back in the back in the early part of the. It may have been the late 19th century, or early part of the 20th century, but the, his name was the Amazing Bondo. He was a high wire walker. And, and, and people were amazed at this guy, what he could do. Uh, and he was soloist. He didn't have anybody with him. And uh, he was about to do a, take a high wire walk one day that nobody had ever done before. And uh, he, he asked everybody there, he said, how many of you believe I can walk this wire? People were going, yeah, yeah, go, man, go. And so he said, well, how many of you believe I can walk this wire and push this wheelbarrow across as I go? Yeah, man, go, yeah, yeah, and they cheered him on. And he turned around to one guy and said, do you really believe I can do this? And the man said, yeah. He said, then get in the Uber. <laughs> <laughs> he never had any takers on that. <laughs> but you see, if you really believe in something, you'll get in it. That's right. If you really believe something, you'll get on it. If you really believe something, you'll get with it. If you, if you really believe something, you'll get it in you. But if, if you don't believe it, you say you do. You give mental assent to it. But you won't get into it. You may have seen Robin Hood split that arrow many times. You may have seen William Tell shoot that apple out of a tree many times. But how many of you will stand 50 feet away and put that apple on your head? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> little puff of wind, little, little, little a twitchy nose, <laughs> a, a bee flying by at the wrong time, and you are skewered. <laughs> <laughs> but if you really believe, it'll impact your world. I believe God. I believe the Bible, and and that, that's that's why I say the things I say and do do the things I do. I was going back and looking at some quotes today, and one of the quotes I looked at said, I, I am not who I am because of what I do. I do what I do because of who I am. Think on that. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Probably going to mess up a couple of minds tonight. Just let me begin reading in verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. 
You know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. Mark that fourth verse. There are diversities of gifts but the same who? Spirit. Spirit. Next verse. There are differences of administrations but the same Lord. Is there a difference in the Lord and the Spirit? Yes. yes. Verse 6. There are diversities of operation but the same God. Is there a difference in God and the Lord and Holy Ghost? Yes. yes. God is the Father, the Lord is Jesus, and the Holy Ghost is the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You got that? Yeah. Three different beings, yet they are all one. That's part of the mystery of the gospel. How can you be three and be one? Well, how can me and my wife be two and be one? But yet God says we're one. Mm -hmm. You look at us and you see a little petite woman about five foot one or something, and you know, and you look at this big old rascal over here with hair on his face, and you say, Two totally different people. But when God looks at her, he sees me. And when he looks at me, he sees her. Because we're one. See, we, we need to get our brain geared and, and functioning in a way that we can begin to see with the spiritual eye. As Paul said, well, I do not look at those things after the flesh, but after the spirit. spirit. Okay. Now, so the gifts, verse 4. Diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 5, differences of administration, the same Lord. And then diversities of operation, but the same God. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit. So, which one's he talking about? Diversities of gifts. Uh, which, which one is he talking about? Holy Ghost? Holy Jesus Holy Ghost. Or, or the Father? Holy Ghost. Holy, Holy Ghost. Ghost. What did the Holy Ghost have in verse 4? Diversities. Diversities of gifts. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Given. Gifts are given. Okay, given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given. given. All right, there it is. It's a gift. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, but all these work up that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. These nine gifts of the spirit are possessed solely by Holy Ghost. And if any of these gifts are manifest, it is because Holy Ghost chose at that moment in time to manifest that gift, whatever it is, or maybe a combination of them, through an individual. They, they don't belong to that individual. Now, now, I know people that certain gifts are operated in them on a regular basis. I've got no problem with that. If we had time tonight, I could show you in the scriptures that the fivefold ministry, which is the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, that in each one of those offices, they don't belong to the man, but in each one of those offices, there are certain gifts of the spirit which are there in the office ready for use whenever, really anytime they're needed. Are you with me? So if, if a person is in the office of, of in one of the offices of the fivefold ministry, then in that, for instance, in the office of the prophet, I'll use that one for example. In the office of the prophet, there is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, prophecy, and discerning of spirits. It's, it's very, very common if you find a person who is a genuine prophet to find those four gifts consistently manifest. In the evangelist, you have gifts of healings, workings of miracles. They, they, the only evangelist mentioned in the New Testament is Philip. 
And when he was ministering in Samaria, what was what was happening? Gifts of healings and workings of miracles are flowing like water. But when it was time to minister the baptism in the Holy Spirit, this miracle worker, the evangelist, called for the apostles to come up. Are you still with me? Okay. The pastor. In the pastor's office, and again, we don't have time to get into that, but in the pastor's office, you'll find uh, diversities of tongues and interpretations of tongues, and then, of course, helps in governments. That's part of that. It's not just the gifts of the Spirit that are in those offices, but the gifts of the Spirit do operate in the fivefold ministry in certain groupings. Are you with me? Word of wisdom and the word of knowledge is a very common manifestation in the teacher's office because he needs a word from God, a supernatural word from God about what to bring forth in the teaching, how to bring it forth, when it's needed, and, and how, how to, that, that's, that's a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, fully together. If somebody's raised from the dead, you have the, all three power gifts operating together. The gift of, of working of miracles, this somebody dead raised up, that is a miracle. Yes, sir. Okay. But what what why why do people generally die? They're sick. <laughs> sick or injured or something. So not only do you need the miracle of raising them from the dead, but the body needs to be healed mm -hmm. or whatever was damaged or destroyed to kill them. Right? Mm -hmm. And because God is not the one who's stepping in saying, I'm going to raise him from the dead. You, you, oh, we need to learn some stuff. Holy Spirit will direct the man he wants to use to be yielded to him. But the Holy Spirit's not the one doing the talking. Who said light be? Uh, God. Where was the Holy Ghost before he said Hovering in the water, over the waters, in the darkness. He wasn't bringing light. Mm -hmm. But the moment God said, light 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 See, the Holy Ghost was right there at the lips of the Father waiting to hear. Mm -hmm. It happened. Okay? Same thing happens today. Holy Spirit, if you are a Spirit-filled individual, if you are an agent of God, an ambassador of Christ, Holy Spirit is right here. Yes, he has filled me up. But it's not just filling me up. Holy Ghost is waiting right here. And the moment I will open my mouth in faith by that unction of Holy Spirit to say to a dead man, you shall not stay dead. Death can't have you. Rise in the name of the Lord Jesus. He acts on my words just as if God Almighty himself had said it. That's the gift of faith. Mm -hmm. All three power gifts manifest at the same time. All right, gifts of the Spirit here. There are nine of them. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, I want you to go with me to the last verse. Well, let's go back to the 29th, 28th verse of 1 Corinthians 12. I mentioned the fivefold ministry, and here it's mentioned as well, which gives us indication that the fivefold ministry has a very direct link with the gifts of the Spirit in certain ways. Look at verse 28. And God has set some in the church. Now wait a minute. What did it say in verse 6? There are diversities of operation but the same God. Okay, so what has God said in the church? Gifts or diversities of operations? Diversities of operations. The diversities of operations, of course, being the seven motive gifts of Romans 12. But in this passage right here, God set some in the earth. We have to understand that the first establishment of the prophet came by the hand of God. In the New Testament, Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are established by the Lord Jesus. He sets men in those offices. In the Old Testament, the first establishment of the prophet came by the hand of God because there were three people who carried anointings in the Old Testament. Remember who they were? Prophet, priest, 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 and king. king. They carried an anointing. 
The, the priest, the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies every year. A, a prophet could go before God, but if he went in the Holy of Holies, he was dead meat. Amen. King didn't go in there. He was dead meat. See, they each had a protocol. They each had a position. They each had a certain anointing, and you have to operate if you're going to walk in the power of God, the covering of God. If you're going to walk in the protection of God, you have to operate within the anointings or the anointing or anointings that are upon your life. Oh, that people could understand that. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say it. When, when people die early, and when I say early, I mean before they're 85 or 90. I could say 120, but I'll just I'll, I'll be kind and say 85 or 90. The Bible says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Where there is no vision, my people perish. You get sick and go to sleep early, you die early because you fail to discern the body of Christ. Discerning the what? The body of Christ. When you do not understand, when you cannot recognize, please folks on Facebook, don't get angry with me. But when we cannot recognize and then when we recognize honor in a certain manner and when we do not know how to create those places where different anointings can be manifest, we are failing to discern the Lord's body. Now, some, some kid may walk in, just got saved last month and baptized in the Holy Ghost night before that. And he comes in, he says, oh, Brother Warfield, I believe I'm called to preach. Fine. I'm not going to argue with you on that. But I will tell you this. You may be as anointed as Moses was, but you ain't ready. There's a difference in being anointed and being ready to walk in that anointing. Are you with me? Amen. It's not, it's not that we are trying to prevent people from walking in the anointing. It's when we try to promote somebody into an anointing too soon or where they don't belong, or we fail to recognize that anointing that is on somebody, and we fail to offer them a helping hand and, if need be, a shoulder to stand on to get up into that position to help them through the process. Amen. That's failing to discern the Lord's body. Amen. So whenever you look at a Christian, you need to understand something. They're anointed for some reason. And one of the reasons that we see strife in the body of Christ is because somebody looks at a person they see an anointing on them and they want that anointing mm. because they don't realize God's given them one that belongs to them. That's right. mm -hmm. And if they could understand that if, if they would learn what they got and use what they have and let that train them and grow them up, they'd be the happiest people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Oh, Lord, just mm -hmm. woohoo! <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Notice this. God has sent some of the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, third to teachers. After that, miracles and gifts of healings, and then governments, helps governments in diversities of tongues. What? Watch this. Look at verse 20, 29. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Now, there's a, there, there's a divine order that's listed there. The divine order is this. It is not the order of relationship that Paul spoke about in Ephesians that Jesus ascended upon high and gave gifts unto many, gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. See, there's an order there. Are you with me? There's a divine order. This is not about a divine order. This is about points of establishment. Okay? Let's look at the New Testament. What was the first established ministry of the fivefold ministry in the New, in the New Testament? The apostles. the apostles. I'm not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when God when Jesus called them apostles. Yeah. Because Jesus only did what the Father said then. Are we still on the same page? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about on the day of Pentecost when the church became the church. The first established ministry in the body of Christ was the 
apostle. What was the second established ministry? Prophet. Prophet. And you find that just by going through the book of Acts. You can find how they're revealed. What is the third established office? Teacher. The teacher. What's this? Apostle, prophet. We got these two. Teacher. See that? That's over here. That's, the, that's, that's a framework. The apostle touches them both. But that's the framework. Okay. What came after the, the teacher? Workers and miracles. Yeah, the, the, he mentioned miracles and gifts of healings. What did Philip do in Samaria? Miracles and gifts of healings. What is Philip called in the book of Acts? The evangelist. So there's the evangelist. He's the only man ever called an evangelist in the Bible. Paul told Timothy to do the work of an evangelist, but Timothy was not an evangelist. What is the last things we see listed here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Helps governments and diversities of tongues. Helps, diverse, helps governments and diversities of tongues. You know who that is? Pastor. Pastor. That's the pastor. Woo. That's the pastor. Yeah. The pastor of a local body needs to know, understand biblical church government. The church is not a democracy. In short, God is not a republic. It's a theocracy. A theocracy does not mean that it is controlled by God. A theocracy means that God is in charge, but he puts people on assignment. When the, when the apostles were so caught up in tending to everybody's needs, like Moses was in the early days, trying to judge all the situations, what did the apostles tell the people to do? Choose out among you seven men full of the Holy Ghost and faith and let them take care of this business of serving and waiting on the tables. That was the deacons. What is a deacon's job? A deacon's job is to deacon. Serve. <laughs> what, what does that mean? That means that they take care of the physical operation of the church. That's a deacon. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, deacons, in, in fact, you know, we won't take time to get all, all in this, but deacons are mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 3, if a man desires the office of a deacon. Uh, let's see. Chapter 3 verse 1 says, if a man desires the office of a bishop. That's that's like a, a senior pastor. All right. Then look down, verse 8. Likewise must the deacons. You see that? Deacons. And there's qualifications for a deacon. Just because he can walk chew bubble gum doesn't qualify him to be a deacon. There needs to there, there are biblical qualifications for him in that. He has to be the husband of one wife. He has not to be double tongued. He's got to be a man of integrity. And that's provable. He's got to be a man who understands the word. He can help in the teaching and ministering of the word. So there's a there's a requirement of a certain level of maturity in that. And that's why in the 28 years that I pastored, every year when I met with my board, the first thing I told them is, gentlemen, this is not a democracy. You have not been selected to represent the body of Christ to me. You have been selected to represent me to the body of Christ. You are my board, not the congregation's board. Mm -hmm. That's church government. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the place of the deacons, this first bunch of deacons that, that, that uh, they told them to do, who did, who did the apostles tell to pick the deacons? The people. The people. You choose out among you seven men of honor and four. Mm -hmm. But that didn't mean they made the cut. When they chose the seven, the seven came before the apostles. The apostles then prayed, seeking the mind of God. And if they met God's approval, then they were. You see the picture? That's the way church government needs to be run. It's a matter of prayer, not a matter of who preaches the hottest, latest sermon because he read the hottest, latest book. Okay.
apostles. Verse 50, 29. Are all apostles? Are they? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Now look, notice this. Are all workers of miracles? No. And do all have the gifts of healings? No. Now remember, that's the evangelist ministry. Okay? And then it says, do all speak with tongues and do all interpret? Those are the gifts of the Spirit that are in the pastor's office. In a properly operated body of Christ, if a message in tongues is given in the church, if there's no other interpreter present, if there's a pastor in the room, it'll come through him. You got that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If a message in tongues is given and nobody has given an interpretation, either somebody disobeyed in the interpretation or somebody disobeyed in speaking the tongue or the pastor failed to shut it down when it should have been stopped. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. All you guys that want to be pastors out there, welcome to the shooting gallery. <laughs> and you ain't holding the gun, Jack. <laughs> Hallelujah. There nine. are nine gifts of the Spirit. How many? Nine. Nine. Notice the last verse of chapter 12. Covet earnestly the best yes. gifts. I've heard all kinds of talk and, and uh, what's the best what's the best gift? What is the one that's needed most at that time? No. No. If it's the best, it's the best. Being the best when you're looking at things that are already established doesn't change. You take three cars made by three different makers in the same year, made as much alike as possible. All the extras and the little doodads and the bells and the whistles, the same on every car. And you take them out and you test them. One of those cars is going to be found to be a good car. But one of them is going to be a better car. And one of them is going to be the best. best car. So you have to have at least three to be best. These are things we should have learned in school, folks. One, one of the great sad, one of the greatest sad things in the in the earth today is the fact that our children are no longer being taught these very principles in school. So when they read the scripture, they don't even know what they're seeing. He said, "Covet earnestly the yes. best." Yes. What? Yes. Gift or gifts? Yes. Yes. Gifts. How many, how many gifts of the Spirit are there? Nine. So that means three of them are good and three of them are better and three of them are best. Thank you. The question is, how do we know which ones are which? I'm about to answer that for you. I know somebody might think, but well, you, you arrogant thing, you know, I ain't never heard nobody talk like this. Well, maybe it's because nobody has taken the time to read the Word of God for what it says and just lay it before you. I'm going I'm 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 to teach it to you that you can receive it or you can deny it. Here goes. There are three vocal gifts. That is, gifts that require utterance. Diverse kinds of tongues. Interpretation of tongues, prophecy. Put those in a category, vocal gifts. There are three gifts that demonstrate the power of God. The gift of faith, the gift of working of miracles, and the gifts of healings. There are three gifts that we would call revelation gifts. They are the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the discerning of spirits. Okay, are we still on the same page now? Yeah. Okay. Let's start with the revelation gifts. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. First of all, let's define them. A word of wisdom is a word from the heart and the mind of God not known to the person to whom it's revealed before they get it. It's a word from the heart and the mind of God, known only to God, that is revealed to the heart and the mind of 
a person, about the future, a word of wisdom. Are you with me? We know from biblical definition that wisdom is being obedient to what you're told to do even if you don't understand it. It's instant obedience. God said, jump on the way up. You ask him how high. That's, 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 that's wisdom. That's obedience. That's the love walk. Okay? So the word of wisdom is a word from God, known only to God, that's revealed to the heart of a believer about the future, something that is going to happen. Okay? Many people call this prophecy. No. A word of wisdom does not always edify, exhort, or comfort. A word of wisdom can sting. Mm -hmm. When Agabus came in and picked up Paul's girdle and strapped it on him and then bound his hands up and said, this is what they're going to do with the man wearing this girdle when he goes into Jerusalem. That was a word of wisdom. He didn't know who Paul was. He didn't know that girdle belonged to Paul. He just walked in and he knew the guy wearing that, it, when he gets to, they're going to do this to him and he's going to be in a world of hurt. That was not, that was not edifying Paul. In fact, it was so unedifying to Paul that he balked against it. And said, no, I, got, I go bound in the spirit. No, he wasn't bound in the spirit. He, he, well, he was. He was bound in his own conceit. He thought he knew more about the voice of the spirit of God than God did. I know that shocks people that you would talk about Paul the apostle. That book. It's in the book, dear heart. Read it. Word of wisdom, future. Word of knowledge. A word from the heart and the mind of God known only to God at that point, not known by the person to whom it's given about the present or the past. Did John know everything that was going on in all the churches when he wrote the book of Revelation? Yes. How could he? He was exiled on Patmos. He didn't get telephone, telegraph, didn't have internet. The only way he could know what was going on in those churches was by word of knowledge. And didn't he write these words? I know your works. Mm -hmm. How they're neither hot nor cold, but because they're neither hot nor cold, cold, because they're lukewarm, God will spew you out of it. See, there's a word of wisdom coming in. I know what's going on now and what's been in the past. Because of that, this is going to happen. A word of knowledge and a word of wisdom together, and neither one of them edified ministry grace. <coughs> word of wisdom, word of knowledge. And then there is the discerning of spirits. The discerning of spirits is not just knowing. A word of knowledge can tell you about a spirit. A word of wisdom can tell you about a spirit you're going to encounter. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why didn't Jesus know the name of the spirit that possessed the demoniac of Gadara? Because there was more than one. No, there was one possessor. He had, he had a legion in him. But there was one that was the possessor. All the rest of them were under that, com that one's command. It's because he was operating as a man. He emptied himself of the divine privilege. And the only way Jesus could have known what the name of that demon spirit was, was if God had given him a word of knowledge or had opened his eyes to the gift of the discerning of spirits so Jesus could, from his spiritual eyes, see that spirit, know what he was, and know what he was there to do. Okay, Now, don't make a mistake here. Don't think that the gift of discerning the spirits is just about devils. In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw also the Lord high and lifting up, and his train filled the temple. And then what else did he see? I, he said, and I saw the seraphim. With two wings he covered his face, with two wings he covered his feet, and with two he did fly. And they flew back and forth across the temple, shouting one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. These are spiritual beings, yet he saw them. He knew what they were. That's the gift of the discerning of spirits. 
He could have known of their presence. I've known of the presence of, and I'm talking about by word of knowledge, I've known of the presence of, of angels, I've known of the presence of demon spirits, but you don't see them. The discerning of spirits, you have full insight into that realm of the spirit. What a lot of people call the discerning of spirits is not that. It is a spirit of discernment, which in reality is nothing but nosiness. <laughs> I know people use that term, well, brother, you need a spirit of discernment. Well, let me put it this way. I have the Holy Ghost. He can discern anything. Yes. But I am not going to try to discern what you are by asking you questions and surmising my own conclusions and then going and talking about you because I'm nosy. Mm -hmm. so All right. Now, one of those is a good gift. One of those is a better gift. Mm -hmm. One of those is the best gift. So which one is the good gift? Well, let's examine it one more time. The gift of the word of wisdom. What is that? The future. It's a word from God about the future. The future. Did Enoch talk about the Lord? No. He did. He said, I see the Lord coming with 10,000 descendants. Stuff. He walked with God. He did. Yeah. And he said, we read about this in the book of Jude, Behold, I see the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. So he saw the Lord coming, which was the rapture of the church, which actually us coming back into the earth with him to set up the millennial kingdom. He saw that in his day before God took him. You know what you call that? Word of wisdom. Did Moses talk about the Lord? Yeah. What was the what was the serpent in the wilderness? Jesus. It was a type and a shadow of Jesus on the cross. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. The stone that Moses struck and then later struck again when he should have spoken to it, that was a type of Christ. Okay? The Red Sea was a type of the blood of Jesus. And the Jordan River was a type of the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And people think that the promised land is heaven. No, the promised land ain't heaven. The promised land is the life we should be leading after we get filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And can I tell you something? When they came into the promised land, they still had some fighting to do. If you think Gilman to the promised land means that your fighting days are over, darling, I hope you didn't drop your sword as you crossed the river. Yeah. Nevertheless, the word of wisdom is a type and shadow of the Old Testament. Because the Old Testament is always talking about the Messiah who is yet to come. The Messiah who is yet to come. Isaiah. He was wounded for our trans. What is that? A word of wisdom. See, now, yeah, I say that it's also it can also be prophetic because it does edify, minister grace and comfort. Are you with me? But it's the Old Testament is generally talking about pointing towards the coming of the Messiah. So that is a word about the future. future. Let's come into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. My brothers and sisters, that is not the New Testament. The New Testament did not begin until the day of Pentecost when the church became the church. When Jesus had been raised from the dead, couldn't have the New Testament until Jesus had been raised from the dead to ratify the covenant with his blood. Now we're still together. But the four Gospels are like a standalone unit. But in the four Gospels, who shows up? Jesus. Jesus. So now Jesus is before them. They see him. They look on him. Now, is this a word of wisdom about the future, or is this a word of knowledge? Word of knowledge. Here I am. Present. It's present tense. So the four Gospels is a type and shadow of the word of knowledge. The word of wisdom was good, but thank God Jesus showed up. <laughs> That's better. Yeah. 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 
And the other revelation gift is what? Yeah. Discerning the spirits. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons yeah, son of God. Of God. That's of the, the three gifts, the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and the discerning of spirits, the discerning of spirits is the best. The best. Yeah. Because again, it's not just limited to devils. That's what people want to hold it back to. Oh, I saw that devil. I saw that devil. <laughs> if I never saw another devil. In fact, I'd be real happy if I never saw another devil. Yeah, really. But I tell you what I do want to see. I do want to see the moving of the spirit. I do want to see God walking in the building and the glory of God all over him because of the kind of glory is on him and recognize it and see it, even when other people don't. I was in a meeting one night with a, with a boy, yes, sir. just attending the meeting and yes, had gone there and, and, and I'll go ahead and tell you what Brother Bo Copeland was. The man was so drunk in the spirit. I mean, it was It was amazing. I don't know how many of you guys might have been down there. It was in Charlotte. It wasn't in the call of yeah. Sunday. It was one yeah, of those. Was he was, and he was doing his best to sing a song down there that night. And every time he tried to start singing it, he'd break over into tongues. He just he could not sing that song in English. He was drunk in the spirit. I mean, just all over the place. He walked out to the top of a four-foot-high stage on the edge of it. And I've never seen anything like it in my life. He put a foot... The, the toes of his shoe hung off the edge. And he took the next step. One of the ushers on his staff did a dive. I mean, he literally, he saw him take this. He dove from about eight or nine feet out. Dove and was laying on the floor like this to catch him from keeping him from hitting the floor. Kenneth Copeland's foot went out, stepped in there, and turned right back around and went back on that stage. <laughs> A guy laying in the floor going, <laughs> you're not a big man, but from four feet up, that's going to hurt, Bubba. <laughs> All right. But you see, he was ready to put his life on the line to protect the anointing. Yeah. But the anointing was so strong that I watched that happen. I was sitting third row, ringside, and I watched, I thought, dude, God, do that again. <laughs> no devil involved in that. That was all. Holy Ghost. Are you, are you with me? Yeah. That's what I long to see. And the gift of the discerning of spirits. Oh, that God would, would, would teach us about this so that when I look at a person and that, that gift, covet that. He said, covet it. We ought to want that gift more than the word of wisdom, more than the word of knowledge. Covet that gift. Why? So that when I look at somebody in 19, what was it, Alma? 1981? So when I look at them, I can see in the spirit something that God has for them 30, 40 years later. I, I want that. It's available. But you got to prepare yourself for it. Exactly. If the only, if the only understanding that. you have of the gift of discerning the spirits is seeing some devil crawl across the floor, darling, it's likely not going to happen to you. Because I'm here to tell you something. I realize there's a very real devil out there. I realize there are very real demons out there. And I realize they're doing everything they can to bring people like me down and destroy people like me. But I also know this. Where I put my foot, the land is mine. And I know this, that God has made me to live above that. He's raised me up to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. He's put the enemy under, of my enemy and his enemy to be under my feet. They are to be the dust underneath my feet. And I'm going to step on them in the name of the Lord. I'm not concerned about some devil called Amen. Amen. I'm not going around him. I'm not going to try to dig under him. I'm not going to try to walk through. I'll step on his ugly self. Hallelujah. Covet Thanks, the best gifts. So of the three revelation gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, and discerning the spirits, I want that. I, I, I'll take them all, but I want the gift of discerning the spirits. Yes. I want that. And to do that, we don't have time tonight. Maybe next week we'll talk about this in relationship to the fruit of the Spirit. Because each of the nine gifts of the Spirit has a manifest fruit of the Spirit that must be in place to support the gift. There were three um, there were three vocal gifts. 
One is the is diverse kinds of tongues. And what is diverse kinds of tongues? It is an utterance given to you by the Spirit in a language you don't understand, neither does anybody else really, unless it's specific before us. But it's, it's given through you a language that you do not understand for the consumption of the public ministry in some way. All right? The, the, the next one that followed on was the gift of interpretation tongue. Right? And then the next of the vocal gifts is prophecy. All right? Now remember, word of wisdom was Old Testament talking about the coming of Jesus. The four gospels is the word of knowledge. I'm here. You can see me. You can handle me. The New Testament is discerning of spirits. Being led by the spirit is primary objective, number one, at that level. Are we still together? Yes. Okay. Now, let's talk about these, uh, these uh, utterance gifts, diverse kinds of tongues. It's a language you don't understand. Right. Does the Bible not teach us that the writers of the Old Testament wrote about things they did not understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. That they longed to look into but could not? Right. Think about David. Created me a clean heart. That man wasn't even born again. He's crying out for something he didn't understand. He's asking God to give him something that could not happen until after the resurrection of Jesus. Are you with me? Isaiah saw it, but he couldn't understand it. Moses saw it, but he just couldn't understand it. All the Old Testament prophets saw it, but they couldn't understand it. The, the Old Testament is a type of diverse kinds of tongues. But then we come to the Gospels. What do you got in the Gospels? The interpretation of tongues. This is what they were talking about, folks. Take a look. So, are you with me? Jesus is now in the earth, in the flesh. The only begotten Son of God. Made in his image, in his likeness. Carrying his glory. The personal image of God imprinted upon Jesus. And he's walking around on the earth and he's healing and he's raising the dead. He's walking on water, turning water to wine. He's doing all these miracles. And John said, if all the things Jesus did were written in books, the whole world couldn't hold it. Wow. And the whole time, that's the interpretation of tongues. <laughs> Jesus showed up and said, you boys heard about it in the Old Testament, but you didn't understand it. Take a look at me. Here it is. Yeshua. <laughs> giving word. Yeah. The one they shouted about and threw their clothes on the ground for. And he said, the base holder beats the rock to cry out. Yeah. See, they saw him. They beheld him. That's the word. That's the, that's, that's, the, a diverse, that's the interpretation of tongues. But then what's the final vocal gift? Prophecy. 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 Now, the New Testament definition of prophecy is not to tell me who's going to win the next presidential election. The, prof the New Testament definition of prophecy is a word spoken in a known language for the edification, exhortation, and comfort to the body of Christ. Amen. Wow. That's right. Mm -mm. That's the best. Don't listen. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to put away the, the, the diverse kinds of tongues. I thank God for diverse kinds of tongues. It's a different manifestation. I thank God for being filled with the Holy Ghost when I'm praying tongues anytime I want to. Because that builds me up. Right. Okay. Right. And I don't know about you, but I need to be built up every once in a while. Oh, yeah. Eight, ten times a day. Oh, <laughs> so that, that's, that's, that's the diverse kinds of tongues. But that's not diverse kinds of tongues building me up. That's the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's right. But diverse kinds of tongues, I'm not going to do away with that. We need that. That's a good gift. Interpretation of tongues is better because diverse kinds of tongues without the interpretation of tongues is confusion. But diverse kinds of tongues with interpretation of tongues is better than diverse kinds of tongues by itself. And then, in other words, both of them together are equivalent to prophecy. But prophecy is the best because you don't need the two people. You don't need tongues and interpretation. You just need somebody who is tuned in to the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I long for <laughs> prophetic words to come through my mouth. Oh, God, Amen. just bring it on. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Oh, man, and the brother Donald more than hungry. I'm starving for it. Amen. Amen. I've got to have it every day. Every day. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you seeing how this builds up? So, diverse kinds of tongues is good. Interpretation of in tongues is better. But the best is prophecy. So now we got two of the best. Deserting the spirits and prophecy. But now we got three power gifts. We got the gift of faith. We got the gift of working the miracles. And we got the gifts of healings. So now let's just stop and think for a moment. You have read, whether you've read it through or not, you folks on Facebook, same thing. Whether you've read it completely through or not, I know not. I've read it many times. But what is the primary manifestation of the Spirit where the power of God is concerned in the Old Testament? Genesis 1-1, Malachi 4. What is the primary manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit in, in power? Faith. Nope. But faith is only mentioned in the Old Testament twice. In the entire of the Old Testament, from Genesis 1 1 to, to Malachi 4, faith is only mentioned through the end of Malachi 4, it's only mentioned twice. Working on the working of miracles. Working of miracles. Yeah. Three million Jews instantly. Full restoration overnight. Poor one day, riches. Kings the next night. Mm -hmm. Slaves one day, free men the next. Defeated one day, victors the next. First thing to come to is the Red Sea. <laughs> Miracle. <laughs> chariot, chariot wheels squared also, but they drave heavily. Miracle. <laughs> Get out in the wilderness. Bang! Hit that rock. Miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Moses come down off the mountain glowing like a Uranium bathed, miracle. 40 days of no, and then back for another 40 when he gets angry, miracle. Interpreted. Yeah. And then quail coming in, miracle. Mamma, miracle. Second time on the rock, miracle. Cloud by day, miracle. Fire by night, miracle. Got you a song. The serpent, miracle. <laughs> well, you ought to be able to put this into a movie somewhere about how. Come to the Jordan. Miracle. miracle. Jericho walls. Miracle. Oh, awesome. 300 men taken out the whole Midianite army. Miracle. Yeah, 300 men. What was it? Meal barrel. Yeah, the meal barrel. Miracle. A little bit of oil in the fields of house. Miracle. I mean, that's what the Old Testament is from one end to the other. Miracle. Every time you turn, miracle. So working of miracles is a good thing, isn't it? Yes. But then Jesus comes along in the four Gospels. What is the primary manifestation of the power of God through Jesus? Yes. Nope. Gifts of healings. Yes. Healings, 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 healings. Every time the man turned around, he's healing people. Even when he was doing miracles, healing was often involved. Yes, he turned water to wine. Don't read about healings. Yes, he walked on the water. Don't read about healing, but I do read about life saving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus did miracles, but most of what Jesus did was heal. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I don't read. The, the, at one time, the people went to the other side and followed him up because they wanted more bread and fish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but in in almost every instance where people sought Jesus out. Chased him down. They needed healing. Yeah. Jairus needed healing for his daughter. The Syrophoenician woman needed healing for her daughter. The woman with the issue of blood needed healing. Brian Bartimaeus needed healing. In every way you turn. Healing, healing, healing. So the gifts of healings are good. But in fact, they're better. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yes. See, if you, if you live in healed, you don't need many miracles. Mm. Amen. Just a thought. Just a thought. But then we get into the New Testament. Remember the Old Testament just had the name the word faith mentioned twice? We get into the New Testament. The gift is faith. Faith. What is that gift of faith? It's when you open your mouth and speak and God acts on your words as though they were his. It's standing on a mountain beside a volcano in Peru and saying to the local missionary, you're looking at a building that's been built over there by the Roman Catholics 
that, that's not even being used because the Catholic priests don't like to go up there because it's hard to breathe. And these people are steeped in their ways. So while they went up there with good intention, they never did anything with it. And they didn't want to let the Protestants out of that building. They, they just didn't want that to happen. And in, in, in their, don't get upset with me. I'm just telling you what I know to be truth. There are some nations in this world where Roman Catholicism has linked up with demonic worship and they work together to try to keep strong Pentecostal Christians and people of faith out. Mm -hmm. I walked into the midst of that in Peru and Arequipa and the devils left town. Can I testify? Yes, yes sir. Me too. We're having a tent meeting in Arequipa, Peru. We're doing medical clinics in the daytime. We're doing teaching training in the daytime for the ministers. We had uh, ministry for the kids on the streets. And there were, I mean, we had we took 60 ministers down with us, between 50 and 60 ministers. And we took a doctor, a cardiac surgeon down with us to, to Peru back in, my, in the year 2000. And so this was going on, great meetings every night. And we, we, we got out there one evening and the sky was clear. And I looked down about 150 yards from where the tent was sitting, there was a tree. The tree had been decorated like something out of, you know, a horror story Christmas. I mean, there were things hanging on it, lanterns, and, 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 and there were people sitting in chairs, and they were down there, you know, sipping on something. And, and, and there, 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 there was people dancing around and spinning. Little, it kind of reminds you of, of you know, an Indian ceremony, Native American. I'm not making fun of the Native Americans. Don't, don't think that. That's just what I, what I witnessed. And I turned around to one of the young uh, ushers, one of the young men that went with us. All of, all of the senior ministers, they assigned an usher or a helper to him. And I turned around to my helper and I said, I'm going down there. He said, what? I said, I'm going down there. He ran back to the tent and told, told a couple of other ministers he's going down there. And his pastor, good man, his pastor told him and another guy, you go down there and get with him. <laughs> Y'all stay with him when he gets down there. Well, I said, okay. So I'm starting down, down that way. I got about 50 yards out and the ceremony stopped cold in its tracks. Music stopped. Dancing stopped. Celebration stopped. And everybody in that group turned and looked back up the hill towards me. I didn't slow down. I just kept walking. I had, an, I, I had a purpose. I had an intention. What was you going to do? I was going down there to cast every devil in there keep it out. There you go. <laughs> I didn't care how many they were, how big they were. I serve a God greater than I you. Oh, well, that's mighty arrogant talk. Don't Lord. call what you want to. I know who I am in Jesus. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I walked in the Hell's Angels compound in, in Winston-Salem, and the whole compound emptied because their dogs laid down when I got out of my car. <laughs> Smart dog. <laughs> Devils don't frighten me. Amen. 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 People don't frighten me. Amen. Glory to God. I'm afraid of neither man nor beast, because greater is he that is in me than he that is in me the world. I didn't say I was stupid. I'm not going to the Carolina Zoo and jump in with the gorillas. That's stupid. That's tempting God. But when I'm on a mission from my Heavenly Father, hell, high water, internal revenue service, it makes no difference. Yes, God. I'm walking in with my head up, my armor on, and I'll slice it tooth into fry before I leave. Walk down that, they, they stopped I kept going about 25 yards out. They left town. They wouldn't even let me get within striking distance. Went back up and the local people were just... No. People were afraid. What are they going to do to Brother Moorfield? So no, the question is what Brother Moorfield is going to do then. Amen. Amen. Samson went in among the thousand and just left them all laying in the dirt. 
We need to understand, my brothers and sisters, that's who we are in Christ. Yeah. That's not just about Beecher Bullfield. That's about every man and woman yeah. sitting in this room, yeah. every man, woman, and young person watching this on Facebook that will see it tonight or in the days to come. You need to realize who you are in Christ. Right. You need to fear nothing. Anytime Jesus ever showed up in any situation, if it appeared anybody was in fear, the first words out of his mouth, be not afraid. You know, that's right. right. Perfect love casts out fear. all fear. fear is torment. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. And I'm living torment free. Glory to God. Yes, right. So we, we of, of the <clears throat> of oh the, of the gifts. Faith. Woo. Faith. The, the 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 revelation gifts. Word of wisdom. Word of knowledge. Discerning the spirit. The best. Is the discerning of spirit. Okay. We're to be led by the Spirit of God in the New Testament, not by fleeces. Alright. Then then we come to the we come to the verbal gifts. Divers kinds of tongues. That was a type and a shadow of the Old Testament. Or the Old Testament was a type and a shadow of divers kinds of tongues. People were writing, but they didn't know they didn't understand what they were writing. Then the four gospels. People were writing, but they understood because they were looking at it. That's the interpretation. We come into the New Testament, now we're moving into the realm where God is talking to his people, through his people, to edify and build up and minister grace so that we can be the overcoming people of God he wants us to be. And then we look at the power gifts, the working of miracles, the Old Testament, replete, the four gospels, the gifts of healings. I mean dynamic with healings, multitudes healed. He came into one place, he healed them all. Thousands of people, he healed them all. God help us. Do you want to see that, Brother Warfield? Yes. 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 Yes, I want to see the working of miracles. I, that'd be fine with me every day of the week. The gifts of healings. But more than that, I want to see the gift of faith in operation because God has given me a vivid imagination. Stood on that mountain in Peru. I told you, I started to tell that a moment ago. The pastor looked at that and he said, Brother Morfield, he said, we, we so want to come up here among these people. But every, all the land up here is taken. We can't find anything and nobody will let us use anything. And I said, you said that belongs to the Catholics? And he said, yes, sir. And I looked at that and I turned and I said to him, it wasn't because I had an unction from God. I turned and said to him, brother, within a month's time, that's going to be in your possession. The Catholics are going to call you and give it to you. Two weeks later, I got an email from this guy in Arequipa, Peru. Brother Morfield, you remember this, right? <laughs> <laughs> the bishop of the, of, the, of the Catholic diocese called him on the phone. We got a building up there. Nobody's using it. We understand you want to get a ministry. If you can go use the building. That's a, that's a gift of faith yes, in operation. Abraham said, my God will provide himself a sacrifice. That was a gift of faith, not only on that mountain that day, but that was the release of a gift of faith thousands of years later when Jesus, <laughs> God in the flesh, walked up on top of Moriah, spread his hands out and said, I give my life. God sacrificing himself. Do you understand what it means now about covet the best gifts? Once again, don't misunderstand me. Do I want the gift of diverse kinds of tongues? Yes. Yes. God, anytime you can, Holy Spirit, anytime it's right. Do, do I want the, the, the working of miracles? Yes, anytime it's right. Do, do I want uh, 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 yeah. hmm. Do, do, I, do I want the word of wisdom? Yes, yes, Lord, anytime it's right. But even more than that, I want to see healings. Amen. I want to see people made well. Even, even more than, than, than word of wisdom, I, I want to see word of knowledge so people understand it's here right now. It's not something they got to put off till tomorrow anymore. It's here right now. I, 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 want, I, I want that, the, 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 the the, the good, I want the better, but I want the best. I want the discerning. I covet the discerning of spirits. Yes. I covet yes. 
the word of prophecy. Yes. I covet the gift of faith. Yes. Because the gift of faith, watch this. Diverse kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy. Prophecy is, e is equal to tongues and interpretations all rolled together. Mm. It's the best. We talk about the, the revelation gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is the best. It's, it's the best. Why? Because it has eyes open to see and understand and, and know what's taking place in the realm of the spirit. And then power gifts, gifts of workings of miracles, gifts of healings, gift of faith. The gift of faith can bring into manifestation gifts of healings and working of miracles. Yeah. It's the gift of faith that raises a man from the dead that calls the gift of the working of miracles and gifts of healings into the operation at the same moment. I covet the best gifts. Oh, God help us. Father, Lord, I know I've gone into some controversial things here tonight. But I pray that you would you would speak into the hearts of the hearers in such a manner that controversy is not the issue, but understanding is. Lord, if it appeared to be something that they heard but didn't understand, Bring it on into the level of understanding, Father, and then take it beyond understanding and let them see it. Let, give them eyes to see. Yes, Lord. Not just ears to hear, but give them eyes to see. Teach us by your Spirit yes, Lord. the depths of the truths of your Word. You did not tell us to covet the best gifts. Mm. So that you could look at us and say, nah, I'm not going to do it. You said ask and you shall receive. You said seek and you shall find. You said knock and the door will be open. You said what things ever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Lord, I thank you that that's more than killing a fig tree. My God. What, what do I desire, Lord? I desire the yes. gift of the discerning of spirits. Yes. I desire the gift of faith. I desire the manifestation of prophecy. Because that's what it's going to take to bring in the being the glorious church. The church of the best. Lord, I'll never stop thanking you for the good. I'll never stop thanking you for the better. But neither will I ever stop coveting the best. For you said to covet the best gifts. I give you praise in Jesus' name. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Jesus. I'm telling you by the Spirit of God. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Prepare your hearts for if you will receive what I have said tonight. You will be witnesses and operators in the best in the days to come. Hallelujah. Everybody that agreed said amen. 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 God bless you folks on Facebook. Thanks for joining us tonight. We'll do it again next week.